Welcome, Church of Rochester. Thank you for joining us online, wherever you are, uh, on a Friday night. Uh, we usually have our Bible study on Thursday, but today we have a special interview with Brother Eric and John Adichuk. And before we start with this interview, let's bow our heads, wherever you are, for a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, Lord, we ask that you you would bless us tonight. Lord, I pray that as we go through these questions, may we glorify you. Uh, may we um, pull wisdom from your word, God, to, to apply to the things that are going around us today in this world, in this time. And Lord, we pray that you would bless us, and I pray that you would bless our church and those who are in need. Uh, Lord, we're asking for your wisdom. We're also asking for your protection and I pray that you would guide us, and I pray all this in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. So, like I mentioned, I'm here with uh, Pastor Eric and Pastor John, associate pastors at the Church of Rochester. And today and tonight, we're going to have a, a few questions that we're going to be asking them to see um, what's going on in this world, to uh, ask these questions, to kind of talk about them. Questions that you might yourself be talking about, asking others as well. So the first question we're going to look at, is what is the appropriate response to the Christian during this current pandemic? I think that uh, seeing what's going on in the world, and especially this crisis, it's overwhelmed many people. But the Christian has something that people in the world do not have, and that's peace. A Christian's response to any situation should be a, a thought-out, careful calm response. There shouldn't ever be a situation that causes the Christian to lose control. Uh, we have the Prince of Peace. Jesus Christ is our Lord and Savior. He gives us peace. He said, I give my peace unto you. And we also have the Holy Spirit, which is our comforter. So in times of crisis, in times of, of, of things that are going on and are out of our control and, and we have no say in it, our response should be that of peace. We know how this all ends. That's something that's comforting me in these days. I'm not, I'm not afraid. I'm not shocked that this is happening. Jesus, Apostle Paul, was predicting and saying these things will take place. Uh, when Christ was talking about the end times, he was saying that there will be wars, rumors of wars, pestilences. And we understand that uh, we might not be living in the end times right now, but these wars, rumors of wars, persecutions have been going on for 2,000 years, and they're happening today. So I'm not surprised. I'm not uh, caught off guard that this is happening in the world. So our response as Christians should be of peace. We should have hope because Christ has predicted all of these things that will take place. And uh, th th this should be reassuring for us that the Bible is true, and, and I find great joy in that. I would like to also just reaffirm exactly what John said, that we shouldn't be caught off guard. As, as Christians, we have to uh, react and think soberly. Uh, unlike the world, which reacts off pure emotions a lot of the times, and a lot of the reactions are negative. But as Christians, John already said, we have the Holy Spirit, we have God, we have peace, we have joy that we're abiding in that's lasting in our life. And we should react soberly. We should think about what we're doing, not let th these things caught off catch us off guard, but we should just have a, a sober thought process on what our next steps are going to be, uh, what the plan is, and not react hastily. So I wanted to follow up a little bit, John, uh, with you starting first. What do you think the Christian during this time should spend their time on? So the response, obviously, is, is, is like you mentioned, is that of peace, and also you mentioned a great point. You said that the Christian really shouldn't be surprised, right? But what should a Christian occupy themselves, their time? What do you think? Yeah, I mean, I think we've been given uh, an interesting uh, period of, of time to live in where we have time that would not be otherwise available to us because we have jobs and, and people go to school. All of that is now canceled, and we have time where we could just spend on whatever we want. And as a Christian, when you see these things that are happening in the, in the world, this should maybe sound the alarm that, hey, hold on, this is a, a uh, unprecedented event. Maybe I should uh, 
prepare myself, get ready, spend more time with the Lord in prayer, studying the word. Because if I did catch myself being off guard, maybe that will sound an alarm in my head and I'll, I should get deeper in the word, understand what the Lord has revealed to us through the word. So next time something like this happens, God forbid, of course, but if it does, I'm not going to be alarmed. We should spend this time wisely with God at the same time. Maybe we didn't have a lot of time to spend with our families and get in touch with other people. This is a perfect opportunity where we have just free time where we could do that in fellowship with one another, uh, not in person, but maybe over the phone or whatever the case may be. Yeah, I, I'll, I'd like to just reaffirm as well what John just said. I think right now we are without excuses, especially as Christians, which we should be always doing this. I'm not going to say just now during this time of quarantine uh, is what we should be doing, but I just think as Christians as well, we should always be working on a relationship with Christ, always building it, getting into the Word, spending time in prayer. But as John said, these things, these other distractions, the things we were preoccupied, maybe work, school, going out, uh, restaurants, or fellowshipping with friends, these, these things have been temporary temporarily taken away from us. We can't do those things. So now we have a lot of time where we spend at home with our families, with our loved ones, and we are without excuse for not working on our relationship with Christ, getting into the Word, studying it, uh, putting in a lot, an, a lot of extra time for prayer, studying of the Word, reading, these types of things that I think that uh, we should be spending our time with right now since there's so much of it. Because we don't know if we'll ever get this type of time. Again, hopefully we don't, but we never know. Yeah, um, Eric, I wanted to ask you personally, and we'll move on to the next question. What do you think in your circles personally for you, do you think there have been more Christians that have been utilizing their time negatively, or do you think that a good portion of Christians that you know have been spending wi their time wisely? Uh, a lot of the Christians that I know happen to be sitting <laughs> on this uh, stage here. But I think I would like to believe, this is what I hope, and I always try to think of the best of, of every situation. I think that people are really taking advantage of this time, as John said. This is a very unprecedented time. We don't know the future. Things are really in turmoil. And I think this takes... This gives people an opportunity to really re-examine themselves, their life, where they stand with Christ, where they're standing right now with their families. And I think this is they're taking it and using it positively. This is what I hope Christians are doing. Yeah, that's important for us as Christians. There is this definitely mindset for us and accountability that we need to spend our time with the Lord. And um, very, very good points because as Christians, we need to look to the Father and like John mentioned, uh, that we have this time to spend time with the Lord. Um, next question here is, as a minister, uh, Brother Eric, what is your biggest concern for the church? This is something that I've been thinking about for not even just when we plan this interview, but this is a concern and a thought that always goes through my head is that people after this will get so used to not coming together, not coming to a building, not coming in fellowship with other believers, and just continue staying at home and doing church online. This is a, a, a fear that I have. I pray to God that it doesn't happen. I pray that people actually use this time to get on fire and want to come back to the church and, and be useful and, and just minister in that. But I really, I really have, that's my biggest fear is that people will just get too used to it. Because why? It's comfortable. You don't have to get dressed up. You don't have to get ready. You can just literally roll out of your bed, uh, eat, lay in, your, lay in your bed, sit on your couch, in your pajamas. You don't have to get dressed up. You don't have to get made up. And you can enjoy church this way. Right now, this is a great blessing that we are able to do that, that we can uh, fellowship in this way, which is going to church online. But when it comes back, I just pray that people uh, leave that and come back into the church because it's hard to get people into the church, into the building we know during these times. But when we have this other opportunity for people, and I just hope they want to come back to the church, be with one another, you know, shake hands, uh, give hugs to one another. This is what I hope people will do instead of the other. Yeah, I would like to add on uh, to what Eric said is that even before this pandemic and, and us being prohibited from gathering, there was a trend developing that people were not uh, coming to church anyway. They, they already had church online. They did not want a fellowship. It was already trending in that direction. So I think that people are even more comfortable. They even have a better excuse not to come to church because even after this thing ends, I guarantee you that many people will have, will have a thought in their mind, I would rather be safer than sorry. I, I'd rather take my chances at home. I, I don't want to, you know, God forbid, so catch anything. So do you anything. think, John, that when we come back that there will be 
a noticeable difference in attendance? I don't want to be pessimistic. I sometimes am, um, not with our church, hopefully, but I think around America and even the world, there may be a, a decline in attendance in church services because uh, for the things that I stated earlier. Um, yeah, so when when this comes back in my thought, I was uh, uh, looking at a sermon and a brother, one of the ser- one of the pastors said, he says, we're already planning for us as a church, a pretty big church. If, if I announce the name, uh, everybody would know. Uh, they're planning their return to the gathering, right? So that they're preparing songs, they're preparing people because they're waiting for this gathering of believers at church again. But do you guys think personally that with 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 all this online that has been shifted, every pretty much everything that we can possibly think of has switched online. John, you're doing college online, right? You're taking classes online. We're uh, a pastor I called today at lunch, he's counseling through Zoom. He's counseling through uh, phone calls. He called me yesterday and said that there was this big prayer request that we prayed for it. The Lord answered it. Praise the Lord. And that contact isn't there. But with this new norm of of this virtual church, um, do you think that people are even connecting right now? Do you mean like, are people connecting in a, in, in a, in a, gr- uh, a great way in the same way that they would meet in church as they are right now virtually? I think no, because of the guidelines and the restrictions that have been set before us. We can't uh, gather together in large groups, but maybe through uh, online, maybe through maybe FaceTime or or phone calls, I hope people are reaching out to one another and and just wanting to check up on one another and and keep some sort of fellowship going. Uh, We know that the normal fellowship that we've come to love and enjoy we, has been taken away from us, but I hope that the different avenues and, and the opportunities that we have through technology right now, I hope people are really uh, taking advantage of that and, and doing what they can to stay relevant with one another, to not just cl- uh, close off with one another, but continue their relationships in that way. Yeah, I, w- I would like to add to that. With technology, I think that it's a correct statement. We could observe that people are not as intimate in terms of their relationships and communication. That that was true before this pandemic happened. People were a little bit standoffish. I mean, before uh, you didn't have all this technology at your fingertips. You, I mean, it, there was no real barriers uh, in terms of what's going on, uh, the guidelines th- that are set. But I think that as this is increasing, people are getting aware, thinking of things that could possibly happen prior before this actually did happen i think it's going to cause people to maybe even be a little bit more standoffish more thoughts concerning themselves how to keep myself safe how to keep my family safe Uh, i mean this is a very delicate issue but with everything progressing i don't see people growing in in intimate fellowship and in relationships with one another unfortunately as ministers, both of you, uh, the three of us as well as two other elders of the church, uh, we minister at a capacity that really, uh, it, you know, someone asked me the other day, uh, you know, are, are you finding more time for yourself? And my response was, no, I'm busier than I was before. <laughs> I'm busier because of all the things that were going on. And same with all the elders as well. We're coming up ways of trying to uh, feed the, the, the flock that we have and to be responsible for spiritually feeding the people we have. Because God has given these people, we're accountable for them. Um, Eric, what do you think personally um, that ministers are going through? And do you think that there's a heavy load or heavy burden that has been on them ever since this started? Yeah, I don't want to speak for all ministers, but I just want to speak for myself in saying that you really have to learn on your feet because a lot of different things uh, that we're doing right now I have never done before because the ministry that we've all known and done is uh, face-to-face a lot of the times. Like you said, you know, pastors who are calling and meeting on Zoom and and Skype and telephone calls, those types of things used to be done person-to-person, face-to-face. You would go to a coffee shop, shake somebody's hand, and get to know what they're doing, uh, how they're doing, or their problems, and and solve them out that way, Or, or ministries where we go out in groups together and do these things. But this has all changed. So 
we're learning on our feet, I think, as we go. Even preaching uh, online to an empty auditorium, that's uh, new for me. Very different. We, I've never done that before. I'm not saying we've preached to huge crowds, but there's at least some people there, you know. So this is very different for me. So for me, it's not that it's hard, but it's just something that I've never done before. So I'm learning. I'm trying to get accustomed to it. Hopefully it doesn't last for too long. <laughs> so, John, I'd like to add, add to that. Do you think any there's a, a bigger burden on, on ministers at the moment? I would say, I would have to agree and say, I, I think there is because of the the fact that this is something so new and it's not that we prepared for it if we would have known six months in advance that there was going to be a pandemic and we would all have to start ministering online it would have been easier but we got caught off guard i would have to say i mean we were planning our thursday bible study we got completely caught off guard and we had to cancel and we had to you know come up with things and and set up cameras and and the stage and whatever the case may be so it is for me personally a lot more difficult uh talking to a camera uh, just uh, i mean it's just a little bit different you don't have that uh intimate setting it's it's kind of strange for me i would have to say but with that being said we have to make it work so i wanted to add a little bit to that with regarding uh, preaching almost an empty crowd um we heard the news today that governor cuomo uh mentioned that we have to extend uh pretty much our pause our standstill of pretty much the economy and and, and staying at home in quarantine um, and only people essential people working uh, with that being said, and, and Eric, you, you mentioned about preaching to an empty crowd, and, and uh, we're sitting in an empty crowd right now. What do you think your biggest, and you might have touched a little bit on this already, what do you think your, your biggest uh, issue when you're preaching to an empty crowd and you're preaching to the camera, what, what really kind of throws you off? I think the thing that really throws me off the most is there's no feedback. Uh, when you preach, even though it might not be a great sermon, even... If you see somebody sleeping, that's some type of <laughs> that's some type of feedback that you're getting. You know, hey, you're not do, you're you're not in, you're not interesting right now. So maybe <laughs> you change, you put some type of emotion in it. But here, you don't really know how it's going. Yeah. You pray and you ask God for for anointing, for help with the sermon. You prepare like you always do, but there's no feedback. You don't see people saying. You don't hear people saying Amen. People are not smiling. There's no emotions on on anybody's face because there's nobody there. So that's probably the most difficult thing for me to get used to preaching into a camera. I think it's more like, uh, you know, an interviewer or a news anchor. You know, they're preaching. I mean, they're they're speaking into a camera. So I just think the the lack of uh, um, people's reaction, you know, no no positive uh, feedback is the, the the most thing that's difficult for me. John, what's throwing you off specifically when you uh, been preaching to the cameras? I would have to say I have I, I feel a sense of. Uh, having to just deliver a perfect message because when you're preaching and there's people there you can kind of stop and collect yourself and it's not as awkward but into a camera every pause every, every misspoken word it just stands out the more so and I'm thinking man I got to deliver a perfect message man I, I just kind of make this flow very nicely and that kind of is messing with me a little bit and for me it's difficult okay so uh, I wanted to go on the next one um, more of a practical uh, question, uh, John. Uh, what do you think are some ways uh, that we, not just as a minister uh, that, that you're serving in capacity, what do you think as Christians today, uh, people who are viewing right now, wh how can we minister as believers? How can we minister during this uh, pandemic? Our church is ministering uh, in, in the uh, delivering food to the hospital. That's just a very, I would say, practical and, and, and good way to minister to people who uh, don't have the opportunity maybe to go and get their own lunch. So it's a good way to minister to people, to spread the gospel. But personally, we can, as I said, you have time. You can connect with people. You can share the gospel, especially the opportunity to share the gospel. I don't think there's ever been a better one in my lifetime. You have a talking point. You have an entrance. It's not, you don't have to come up with a clever line or, or to find an avenue to crawl into. You can you can bring up the, the gospel almost immediately because everybody is thinking this is a crisis. This is the end of the world. It's such a, it's such a wonderful way to just present the gospel and, and uh, minister to people in that way, I would say. What do you think, John, specifically, though, with um, people coming aside and helping people with the, the hospital 
uh, giving of the food of the hospitals. How, how can people of our church support that? Well, of course, you can support financially. You could because uh, unfortunately, it's not free. You got to buy the food. You got to purchase it. Uh, you, you you could pray for uh, for when we deliver this food that it actually is more than a meal for people. That when they see this food, they understand it was provided by a church. And we're not doing this to promote our church. We're doing this to promote the kingdom of God and say, listen. Jesus Christ, he loves you, and he cares for you, and if you do not know him, he wants to enter into a relationship with you. This is something that we can, as even though you might not be delivering it, but pray for these meals that say, hey, God, use this in a way that somebody, uh, you know, grows in a relationship with you. Yeah, that's a, that's a good point, especially with the, the meals. And Greece Assembly has been really partnered, uh, we've partnered up with them. And we've been able to, to give these meals to these pro healthcare professionals as well. To, uh, even yesterday, an opportunity came up as well. Uh, we're providing, uh, our church as well is providing um, phone chargers. It sounds almost kind of ridiculous, but um, there's a bunch of people, especially in New York City, the epicenter of this uh, coronavirus pandemic in New York City, people who are getting admitted they're they're tested positive for this COVID-19 and they're they're coming in with just what they have and they can't get the other clothes to change they can't have anything else and their phone dies and they they weren't prepared to bring their phone charger and I was talking to a minister down in New York City uh, and some of the ways already today at the church uh, has supported sending chargers down there to this specific nurse and helping them out so that's uh, as John mentioned already uh, about helping out in the hospitals. This is another avenue as well. So uh, that's another practical way that Christians already have been doing, especially in our church. Um, Eric, from your kind of view, um, how do you think that um, as, as, a, as a Christian, other ways to minister other than what John already mentioned? Uh, in my notes, I, the first thing that I said is giving because a lot of ministries that people held in the church, whether it be uh, uh, usher or children's ministry, uh, these types of things, um, behind the scenes ministries, uh, I would say, uh, they're not able to take part in them anymore. So there's only a few ministries that are uh, able to keep on going, such as uh, preaching or uh, the new things that have opened up to us, like delivering the food. So we can't all do that because there's let's just say there's 50 people in a church that serve 50 people can't go and do that so one way that we can is continue giving i know that's like a, something that's very sensitive right now because it's, it's such a hard time so it, it's difficult to ask people to keep on giving but i think during this crisis it doesn't mean that we take time off of uh being faithful to god in this area uh, god has provided for us and i and i believe and i know that he will continue providing for us and if we can't ourselves go out and do these things if we can't go and buy the food physically ourselves we can give uh financially to these ministries that are continue going and, and take part in that way as well as john said we could call up to people ask them how they're doing pray for them i think this is a big thing since we have a lot of time that we could really pray and bring uh certain needs of our of our fellow christians fellow brothers and sisters to the altar of god i think that's a one very important one especially in a time like this that people can really take a hold of yeah, yeah especially during this time i think one thing that as a team, we've uh, experienced that ministry for us, even for the church, uh, if we think about it on a, this overview level, if we step back for a bit, uh, ministry for us, it did not stop. Even, even when, Brother John, you mentioned that Bible study was actually March 12th. I remember you were supposed to preach, right? Yeah. And uh, you didn't, you, you know, we had to cancel it. We met together. We prayed. So ministry for us hasn't changed, but the way we minister does you know it's that's changed and uh eric mentioned it and, and that's actually uh, also a, a great actually point that we have to think on our feet especially during this time we've been almost a month into this or i think maybe more than a month um and things are constantly changing right but it's interesting to know that the ministry does not stop uh eric i wanted to ask you a little bit hot kind of a, a question that's a little bit um i would say uh, more of a heated question or a hot button topic is what do you think per, per, you know personally about the COVID-19 conspiracy theories uh, if you're on social media these 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 conspiracy theories are being circulated so fast uh, it's really incredible you don't have time to read everything that is out there what do you think uh, of all that's going on regarding this uh, I wish I could call a friend up who's an expert <laughs> in conspiracy theories but my take on it I just want to read one uh, passage of scripture 
Uh, it's going to be from Proverbs 14, uh, verse 15. The simple believe every word, but the prudent man looketh well to his goings. Uh, I'm not an expert in COVID. I'm not an expert in 5G. I'm not an expert at vaccines. So what I would say is to be very careful with the conspiracies. Like you said, there's a lot of conspiracies. A lot of people send them to me. Uh, I look at some of them. I, um, but I'm not accepting everything. Uh, I, I sift through it. Like I said, I'm not an expert in these topics. They could be true. They, can't, they might be false. I don't know. But I think that the conspiracies are just, they're building a lot of fear in people because conspiracy theories are usually negative, uh, especially when it comes to, to what's going on right now. A lot of them are negative. The, the, uh, the vaccines are bad for your health. The 5G is bad for your health. So a lot of these things are working up and it's negative to people's lives. They're uh, emotionally charged right now, especially with fear. And I, th I don't think right now it's doing any good because there's enough real things, not even conspiracy theories, but there's a lot of real things right now that we should be worrying about. And, and, and thinking about, uh, let alone to entertain conspiracies, which we don't know if they're true or not. They're not backed by any type of evidence. It's just a lot of thought. So I would just say be careful. Be careful what you expose yourself to. Be careful what you're taking in. Um, it seems like a lot of people are experts right now. <laughs> experts at everything. Uh, so we just have to be very careful with what we're uh, consuming right now because we have a lot of time. Uh, we have a lot of free time, and a lot of people are spending it behind some sort of sc screen, receiving something. So I would just say be very, very careful. Do your research. Really know what's being talked about. I would like to maybe take a different perspective on, on, on this one here. I don't like the word conspiracy theories or the two words conspiracy theories. It's, to me, it's very dismissive. Uh, of course, there's more than one angle there's more, there's more than just one explanation to what is going on. And I'm not even talking about just in particular here, but there's a lot of theories that people have. And uh, what we see and what we hear is that it's bad, it's negative, the world's coming to an end, there's evil people behind the scenes. Why I believe that is because I believe the Bible. 1 John 5.19 says that the whole world lies in the power of the evil one. I believe that this whole world lies in, the lies in the power of the evil one. He's the one that's pulling the strings here. I'm not shocked by these conspiracy theories. I'm not saying that I believe in every single one of them, in, in, uh, like as Eric mentioned, the 5G and whatever the case may be. But I believe that the whole world lies in the power of the evil one. Something is going on. We can't put our finger on it and have a very good explanation. But as Eric would say, as Christians, friends, I don't think that the right thing for us to do is to watch all these conspiracy theory videos. What we should do is read the Bible and understand that the conspiracy is being orchestrated by Satan. That's true. That's absolutely true. But we should be aware of that and take time and, and consider what the word of God says and prepare ourselves. Yeah, I would even say that uh, not even just you know the videos that are being sent online, but even the news. Even the news is working people up. Uh, we don't know what's true and what's not. Especially right now, there's a lot of misinformation coming from uh, people, coming from different type of uh, video clips that you're watching on YouTube, and as well as news. So you don't really know what's true. You, you don't know what to receive. So I just think uh, uh, just walk very carefully. Uh, that would be my take on that. Yeah, we, I had a, uh, a coworker ask me um, s similar to what we've been talking about. And my quick response, and, and th this person, um, this individual is a Christian, and, and, I, and I was looking at, and, and I informed this person in John fifteen eighteen. it talks about how if the, Jesus was saying, if the world hates you, you know that it hated me first, right? And so that's bold for me because let's just take, for example, and, and I was talking to this Christian, I said, let's just, for example, let's just say all the conspiracy theories that are out there are true. Does the goal of the Christian change? No. Absolutely not. The goal of the Christian, as has been mentioned already, is to, uh, is to cultivate that relationship with Jesus. And so uh, my response right away and in, 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 in what Eric was said is actually hits the nail on the head. You have to sift through what is true because a lot of even through the, 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 the news media outlets that we trust, there's a lot of misinformation. But as a Christian, regardless of if all these are true, vac vaccinations, mandatory vaccinations, 5G, all this stuff, if, if it's true, 
the goal and the mission for the Christian doesn't change. And so um, I wanted to, I was, I informed this Christian, and, and um, I don't know if that Christian will ask me anything more about these conspiracies again, um, but I, I thought that was interesting that the world already hates us, and I think, uh, John, I talked to you about it, and we talked about a little bit more about the church being uh, blamed for a few things here and there. Um, I'm not surprised uh, in neither of us on the stage either. We're not surprised that the world hates the church. It's going to happen. Yeah. It's always happened, and it's going to continue to happen. And that's not a conspiracy. That's found in the Word of God, the words of Jesus. That's what he said what will happen. Eric, do you think it's a, it's a big surprise that, you know, some, some, some Christians and some churches have kind of seen, uh, I wouldn't say as go far as persecution, but it's kind of some blame and some attack single, being singled out? Yeah, like John said, uh, it says in the Word of God that they hated me. Uh, Jesus speaking, they will hate you too. Uh, they persecuted me, they will persecute you. So this is not something that's new. It's happened uh, for 2,000 years. The whole the church has experienced that. I don't think in the United States, per se, we've experienced any type of persecution. But I think right now it's giving uh, the general public a reason to maybe hate the church. We spoke about a lot of opportunities that, we're, that the church is doing uh, for the world to look favorably on the church. On the church and, and uh, by providing meals and things like, like that but as this is also given an opportunity to maybe look negatively uh, upon the church that they're not the following the mandates or rules that are being set and just continue doing their own thing so I hope not but I see that that is happening a little bit right now uh, so I wanted to kind of throw a lighthearted question in the mix here um, how's the quarantine life going for you Wonderful. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um, I don't want to sound insensitive. It was great. Uh, it was great because we've currently been laid off of work, so not much changed other than us not meeting together at church. So it was a very smooth transition for me. Um, I see that you haven't trimmed your beard. Uh, see, with the with the lack of. Uh, you know, <laughs> people around. It doesn't really matter how I look. So I just, I'm letting myself go. I'm trying to something new. Is your new wife and, okay with the beard? Uh, she doesn't know about it. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> I'm joking. Yeah, she, I mean, uh, she likes it, I guess. I wanted to also, uh, more of a poignant question. Um, what books have you read, John, that um, maybe through this quarantine that you could share with everybody else? Well, I've been really uh, fascinated by the sovereignty of God. Uh, I've been kind of trying to do some research on that, and, and uh, I'm reading a couple books, so one by A.W. Pink, it's called The Sovereignty of God, and another one by D.A. Carson, uh, Divine Sovereignty and, and Human Responsibility. That's pretty serious books, John. They're very, <laughs> that's a heavy book, heavy book, but good thing I got a lot of time. So I, I can read. That's true. No, that's, a, that's a serious topic. I, I honestly thought you were joking for a minute, but no, I actually believe you 100% on that. Eric, what do you think, uh, where were you personally, what do you think, uh, how, how's the quarantine life going? Um, <clears throat> I don't know if you could tell by my physique because I'm sitting down right now, <laughs> but I've definitely put on a little bit of weight. As John said, we've been laid off from work since uh, the winter. So in the aspect of work-wise, nothing's really changed much because we haven't been working. So we'll, we just recently started, but in that in, in that aspect, nothing really changed. But uh, quarantine is pretty good and get a lot of time, like uh, John said, to read, to study. I've been also reading a couple interesting books. Um, that I've been reading, The Quest for Cosmic Justice by Thomas Sowell, uh, as well as a book by A.W. Tozer called Worship and How to Obtain Fullness. I, I don't know if I can share what I'm reading because it's like... Yeah, I mean, <laughs> the only thing that beat you is Systematic Theology book. <laughs> I'm actually Henry reading one Thiessen. of those, too. <laughs> Henry Thiessen's Systematic Theology. Yeah, there's a lot of broad topics, uh, you know, you could study upon, so... Man, yeah, this not, time I don't want to share anything I read anymore. You probably shouldn't. <laughs> <laughs> this time, it's just causing me to think uh, deeper thoughts than usual because of what's going on. I mean, the world's at a standstill, doom and gloom, and you're just sitting around and thinking, man, I should get down to the bottom of some things, uh, especially with all the time I have. I don't, I don't know if a lighthearted book like Dr. Seuss or something is <laughs> appropriate for, the, for these times. Did you guys correlate you guys reading the same kind of... 
No, no. <laughs> uh, I was never really uh, <laughs> interested in economics or anything like that. But as the thing started going along uh, and we were kind of forced and thrown into that. So that's why I kind of picked up a book on economics and tried to, uh, you know, study on how things work and when things go bad, what happens. <laughs> so. Yeah, for the sake of uh, our viewers and, and uh, for me not to be embarrassed, I've written down the few books that I have. Uh, if uh, anybody wants to know them, I will text you. Um, <laughs> I will not share on live. Uh, online right now um but regarding the quarantine kind of a little bit more on that do you th have you guys purposely sought out certain relationships and i'm not talking about church because i know that you guys personally almost on a daily level to reach out to church members what do you think about family have you personally um have gone uh, you know have you reached out to your parents or 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 siblings have you got closer to them or have you spent time with them what, what, what do you think what do you guys think well, I've been talking to my dad about 10 times a day on the phone. <laughs> he calls me usually first thing in the morning. <laughs> Yesterday, he called me around 930. So I've been talking to my dad a lot more, I think, because he has not much things going on. We don't have much going on, so we just kind of <laughs> bug one another. So I think the family relationship as well as us being next door neighbors almost. So uh, our family relationships, I think, are growing and getting stronger. That's a positive uh, that I could take from the quarantine. So, <laughs> Yeah. I, w I would have to add that I think from from a perspective of of a family life it's getting a little bit stronger especially with my wife I, she doesn't also she doesn't work uh, uh, the whole week so we have the whole day to spend together and and with my family I think these sober times you really begin to value uh, family more because you understand that the world is not gonna be here tomorrow because you said so. Yeah. Anything could happen, you understand what I'm saying? So I think that these times kind of bring some clarity what's truly important. And for me personally, I, I'm trying to, to spend time with my family and to reach out to my brothers and just grow in relationship, not take it for granted because we never know what's gonna happen and what can happen in the future. Yeah, that's true. I wanted to throw another one in there, lightheader one before, uh our next question is a little bit deeper. Uh, what do you think your favorite meal is during this quarantine? If you had to pick one, honestly, I've been I've been eating a lot of popcorn. Um, <laughs> so I've been eating a lot of popcorn. So um, it's just good. I don't know what my wife does, how she makes it, but it's so good. Uh, so I've I've been having a lot of that. Yeah, my wife's a, a very good cook, and everything that she cooks is, is good. But she's been making a lot of pasta dishes. Uh, that's why I've gained all this weight. I'm gonna. <laughs> that's my excuse, as well as chocolate chip cookies. I've been eating a lot of those, especially at night. Uh, you know, a, a tall glass of cold milk and chocolate chip cookies is pretty, pretty much what I've been really uh, feasting on. That's uh, that's no joke. That's that's good stuff. Um, let's let's kind of switch kind of perspectives here. Um, as Christians, as believers. With kind of the mandates that are kind of being set, and, and it, you only you only kind of realize every time you hear, you know, you almost kind of can't keep up. That's what I, I, I've kind of seen myself personally. When you're hearing these um, briefings, um, you know, by different governors and and, and the president and their his task force, it almost as if you can't keep up with everything. Uh, but what do you think with the government's guidelines on gathering for the church? Um, how long do we personally do we adhere to these uh, to these things? And also, uh, Eric, what what is the make or break in this? So, what I would say is that as the church, we're the light. We have to be a good example to the world. And when it comes to following laws and guidelines that are set by our government, we have to follow these things. This is what the scripture asks us and tells us to do. So, I think in the aspect of uh, the guidelines and things that have been given to the, by the government for us as Christians and as the church, we should follow them. Um, if they say we can't gather, we shouldn't gather. But there is, like you said, a, a breaking point where um, it just has gone too far. I think the, the thing that would break it for me is when they would start letting different type of gatherings, I would say maybe a sporting I mean, event. More like, a, like almost kind of like a singling out of yeah. the church. I think if they would single out the church, it, let's say if they opened up movie theaters, because that's comparable to the church in this aspect of the seating, right? We're very close together. The theaters are very close together, or maybe sporting events. So if they would start opening up 
these types of events to the public, but they would keep the church closed. That's when I think that we would have to take a stand as the church and uh, say that we're not uh, being treated fairly, and which is a lot of pastors are doing that right now. We have to remember as well that these are guidelines and suggestions. They're not law. So you're saying almost you kind of... You're kind of going to the path that, hey, the Bible tells us submit to the to the government, to the authorities that be, that God has in place for us. But you're saying, hey, if they single out the church and, the, and you're seeing everything else being allowed, then, hey, we're going to have to we're going to have to break that guideline. Right. Exactly. Exactly. That's exactly what would be my breaking point that if if the church got singled out, if everything else is coming back to normal, uh, everything is coming back online but they single out the church, that's when I would take uh, a stand and say, enough, enough of this. John, where, where do you um, fall in line with this? I, I, in my thought personally is that I, I, I agree wholly, fully with, with Eric. Um, is your, do you have a different perspective for me to add on that? I would say that Christian or, or not, we don't like following rules. <laughs> I don't think that's something that's particularly yeah. shocking to us. We don't like following rules. Um, but this is a very delicate, delicate topic because the church, the, the ecclesia, the gathering, the assembly, when we speak about that, that's what we're speaking about, assembling, gathering together. And that's a very vital part of Christianity. And we, for the past month, going on to a month and a half, it's going to be two months by the time May 15th rolls around, we can't gather. I think that that's a serious problem. And when I see pastors who are continuing to gather, I don't criticize them. I don't criticize them. I, I, I don't view them in, in a bad light or in a, in a negative light. I, I understand why they do that because it's extremely important. And as Eric said, these are not laws. Should we follow them? Is it a good idea to adhere to these uh, guidelines? Probably. It is. I would say so it is. But it's, it's, it's very difficult. Um, John, you mentioned to me before that almost kind of like a, on, a, on a different level, you said that for our church specifically, you're saying, hey, I, I don't want to be responsible for someone getting sick because you're thinking, hey, I want to make sure our church is safe. Do you remember that conversation I had with you? Yeah, I did. Um, what do you think? Do you think that that's still valid for you personally? Do you think, hey, I, I want to make sure that our church, our, people in our church are safe. They're not, uh, we're not passing this thing around. W do you want to expand on that? Absolutely. I mean, we are responsible. We're accountable for these people, not only spiritually, but if we call them to an assembly and there are people who are sick in our in our church, then we're kind of allowing them to maybe pass on it to somebody else. So uh, that's, that's one aspect. If we knew somebody had this virus, but we, we know and, and nobody's came out and said that they have it. So we're kind of in the clear. Uh, thank God for that. Uh, so once again, I mean, honestly, I didn't think it was going to last this long. So as time passes, I, I, I'm seeing that people are healthy. Do you, do you think that Praise the decision God. that we made in the beginning... When, you, when, when the elders sat down together and we prayed, and I remember you mentioned, hey, we got to cancel right away because we don't know what's going on. Do you think that we made that decision as early as we did? Do you think that, hey, that was a great decision? Yeah, I think that was a wise decision um, because we didn't know. We had no information, no facts about what's going on, how contagious is this virus. But as I said, as time is passing, we see that everybody's healthy in our church. Nobody has this. And, I mean, it's going to be two months by the time we can gather again. So it's making it, it's putting it in a new perspective. So I think it's very, um, it's a difficult decision, but we understand that the good thing is to do it is to follow authorities, Romans 13. Um, but if they, as with the question that you asked Eric, what would be the breaking point? I mean, if they forbid us for maybe a year or two to gather, that, that, that's, I don't think that's something it's going to be a tough pill to swallow for us um, because we see even in, in, in the scriptures, I mean, Daniel was forbidden to pray to God. He had, to, he had to worship Nebuchadnezzar, that statue that he built. And Daniel continued praying. And, and, and his friends, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they said, listen, we're not going to bow down to you. And it meant just if he didn't pray, that meant he could, he could live. 
just one spiritual discipline meant that hey, this is this is reason to to give my life up. Yeah, I mean there are many there are many examples. Uh, how about the midwives in in Egypt? And, and they didn't throw the baby. Can we assemble at your house if? Uh... <laughs> Yes, <laughs> yes, we can, I, I, because uh, I truly believe, uh, and even touching on the question that you asked earlier, that I have a, I have a concern that people are going to get so used to this, and, and with the trending as it was trending for these online services anyway, it's going to continue going, and I have a fear that maybe people are not going to want a fellowship. So we got to be we got to be careful and, and wise, and, and ask the Lord for wisdom because. Um, I don't want to make a mistake. Yeah, there's definitely a lot of a lot of things to think about, especially within this uh, question itself about government uh, guidelines. Um, I wanted to move to the next in question, sub question under here, and, and John, you kind of already hit 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 on this, and uh, Eric, I wanted to ask you about your kind of perspective, specifically on if uh, some thoughts that you have that some churches are kind of going against these guidelines they're meeting. Um, and some pastors actually, unfortunately, a few articles that I've read on Christian Post uh, that they have published uh, have actually died as a result of gathering. The pastor, the, the shepherd of the flock has passed away. Few, you know, these, there are almost a few of these articles that I've read. Um, I know Eric's on the, uh, John's on the side that he is, you know, he, he said that I, I really don't criticize them because uh, I, I understand it, right? What do you think on that point that, um, some of these pastors are bringing these some of the, the his actually sh his uh, congregants to um, harm's way, and what do you think personally with these churches who are uh, are still meeting? Um, I don't think it's ever a bad thing to err on the side of caution, um, but I don't really know the circumstances because we know in a lot of different states the situation is very different than it is in uh, New York City or even upstate New York where there is. Uh, a higher number of, of these cases than maybe somewhere uh, else in the states, in, in the country. So I don't really know the exact um, circumstances, how many people there was in the state or, or in that county. There could have been no people there at all that had the virus. So for them to stop gathering uh, would kind of maybe seem foolish to those pastors. But I, I think that I want to I want to believe that they prayed with God, that they counseled with God, and as well as uh, their leadership teams, and they didn't make a rash, irrational decision by just going and, and uh, continue doing it, even if there was some type of danger. Uh, I don't want to believe that there was people there that they were sick and they just still continued to to gather. I don't want to think that, but um, I think that, that that was maybe a make or break it for them. Uh, just not even being able to gather was the thing that kind of, you know, set them off and saying, no, we're going to continue gathering. Uh, like we were speaking about earlier, these are not laws. Uh, these are not laws. They're, they're guidelines that we should adhere to, but they're not laws. So we can't say that they were breaking any laws. So uh, it's kind of difficult. It's a difficult question to add, uh, answer, but um, I don't look at them negatively. I want, I want to say that. I don't look at them negatively. I think as a church... Once something is contradicting the word of God, that's when it, that's when it breaks it. So we're not supposed to forsake the assembling of ourselves. Um, that's what Scripture says, and they continued. Yeah, I've I've even noticed uh, an article by uh, Will uh, Barr, the Attorney General, talking about how that specific even some mayors and government officials are actually singling out churches to do even drive-in where the people are in their cars, they're having the church. And uh, praise the Lord, there was uh, <clears throat> one one place where the Eternal General actually mentioned specifically that official actually stepped aside and let that church assemble because they weren't breaking any rules. They were social distancing, which is a very weird that we're a phrase that we have to kind of get used to now, right? Yeah. <laughs> social distancing. Um, but yeah, it's, it's actually, I think uh, we're on that same level here. It's talking about it's, we don't know the situation going on with that pastor or that individual. And I think airing the side of caution, as Brother Eric mentioned, is, is a, wise, a very wise uh, wise path to go through. Um, I wanted to go on a little bit heavier. This is our last question, a little bit heavier uh, topic. Um, John, do you think that the time that we're living in, and this is mentioned quite, quite often among uh, our circles and Christians, 
is this God's judgment on the world? And also with this pandemic, uh, do you also think that this is, could be the end time? I think this is God's judgment on the world in a general sense because uh, this is God's wrath against sin. Uh, we understand that we're not only fallen in our nature, but the world was cursed as well, the earth that we live on. And, and the Lord has been, uh, you know, actively involved in this. And we see even in the scripture, Isaiah 45, is uh, God says that I make well and I create calamities. So this is the punishment. This is the wrath of God against a sinful world. Um, and it's something for us, even, even in Romans 8.22, for we know that's very important, that the whole creation groaneth and travaileth in pain together until now. This is what's currently happening, uh, not just this pandemic or this pestilence, but every single thing that happens, I believe, is God's judgment on a fallen world. Now, I'm not saying that this is a judgment against believers because we understand that there is no condemnation to those who are in Christ. We are not being condemned with this world. We, are, we have no condemnation because we are in Christ. But I believe that this is a, a judgment of, of God against, uh, against the fallen world. And, and especially, I would say, in particular, the country that we live in. Uh, it's, it's, it's the judgment of God on America. And, and not only this, but even in Romans 1, it says they refused. They chose not to worship God, the creator, rather than the creature. And God gave them over to a reprobate mind. And the judgment that we read in Romans 1, the homosexuality and, and what's happening in our country, that is already a judgment of God. And the calamities and the pestilences and everything else, I believe it is. What do you think about uh, end times? Do you think that you would kind of rope that that in and say, hey, this is this is possibly the signs of the end times? That's a difficult question. Um, I'm going to be uh, going on YouTube Live after this interview, and you guys could watch my full... Uh, <laughs> no, I'm joking. I don't have any insider information, uh, just to make that clear. I don't know. I'm going to say this, that nothing else has to happen for Jesus to come back. So you're saying that he could come back now and that would be sufficient or, or that would be appropriate? Yeah, for nothing else has to take place for Christ to come back. Uh, is this the 70th week of Daniel as it's written in the book of Daniel? Is this the seven-year tribulation? I don't believe it is. I don't believe that this is that time that we are living in right now. Because even in 2 Thessalonians, when Apostle Paul is writing to the, to the believers, he says, beware, don't be caught off guard, don't be shocked, because certain things still have to happen before the end comes and you're going to see the the man of lawlessness sitting where he ought not to sit then you're, you're going to be uh you have a better orientation on what's happening so we don't see that so i don't think it, it is the end times eric on uh the god's judgment on the world um john is, has that perspective that he believes with with what's with sufficient evidence of scripture hey he believes that this is god's judgment uh, in a general sense wouldn't you agree on a general sense and also specifically uh, talking about america um i actually my response more is to, is a different reproach or a different approach to john's even answer um what do you think personally that this this pandemic is is a sign of this is a sign of the end times is this god's judgment on the world i think that the people that do believe that this is a judgment of God, whether it is or not, or whether this is the end times or not, we are not the first people in our generation to think this thought. I think that uh, when the church was being persecuted, the early church, when it was uh, Apostle Paul was writing, they didn't know if this was the end time to be ready. Uh, Peter was saying the same thing. So I think that ever since the church was birthed, people have been thinking, believers have been thinking, this is the end. Uh, I, in 1917, we, you know, I never knew about this until actually this pandemic that there was one in 1917 where they're estimating anywhere from 50 to 100 million people died. I, I'm, I think that a lot of people thought that that was God judge that that was God's judgment on the world as well as the end times or World War One, World War Two, these types of judgments. Um, so, and even going back further, uh, the plagues where some were estimating that. 50% of the world's population that died. And there was other flus where it took one out of four uh, people. So uh, this is not the first pandemic, and those were a lot worse than this one is currently. So I think that, as John was saying, that this is uh, uh, God's judgment 
in a general sense because of sin coming into the world and, and the natural world being affected on it, affected by it. So in that sense, I do believe uh, that is a judgment of God. Can I say that this is the end times um, with concrete uh, evidence? No. I can't, I can't say that because it says only the Father knows when, when that's going to happen. So I, I can't. I can't say that. I'd like to add, if I can, David, with, uh, in regards to the end times, if it is or isn't, I want to I wanna reiterate what you said. It doesn't change what our uh, duty is as Christians. Because when Apostle Paul was writing to the Thessalonians, they believed that it was the end, and they kind of quit working. They were just sitting around. That. That's why Apostle Paul They're writes, if a man <laughs> doesn't work, he shouldn't eat. I don't want us to fall into that category. Hey, this is the end. Let's sell everything and just look up at the sky and wait for the return of Christ. We should still be about our Father's business. That, that doesn't change the fact. Yeah, I think, what John, what you mentioned, um, I actually, to, to be really clear and honest, is that when people have been spouting that this is God's judgment, I actually kind of, I kind of had some kind of anger, like, oh, you know, how, how do you have the audacity to... But I would think, especially with some of the scriptures that you've mentioned and, and through praying, that if this is, let, let's say that God, we can definitely say that this is God's judgment on the world. And in the midst of the Christians as well, we're, in, we're living in that world, in this world. I deserve hell, right, for my sin. And so the punishment, the judgment that if, if, if God is doing this, I deserve all, all of it. And so my, my mindset completely has changed praying about this because uh, Jesus Christ died on the cross for my sins, right? And I'm thinking more of a specific for me. I, I have done nothing for God for me to attain this. And if this is judgment, then I deserve all of it, right? And so I kind of, uh, towards John's response, because I, I think some of you may a viewing may view, hey, you know, John's response was pretty, pretty harsh. Is this God? We don't deserve, and my response is, I don't know if this is God's judgment. That's kind of my answer to that. But if this is, <clears throat> my sin in itself sends me to hell. But a righteous God came down and still saved me. He gives me, he gave me eternal life. And if through the midst that it, this possibly could send me home to, to heaven, uh, then I went. <laughs> I think that's a very beautiful thought that John just said that um, we don't know, right? And, and we shouldn't stop working. Uh, we don't know if this is the end times, which just speaks about the Bible, but it could be the end time for us as an individual. We don't know if we're going to wake up tomorrow. We don't know what's going to happen. This could be end. So as Corinthians writes that we should examine ourselves, whether, it be, whether we be in the faith. We shouldn't just be thinking like this or, or thinking about eternity when things are getting crazy in the world. This is a thought that we should be always thinking, uh, examining ourselves, um, because we don't know. We truly don't know what's going to happen if this is uh, the end times, but it could be for some of us. We don't know that. So I think that um, to keep that in mind as well. And uh, I just want to read uh, just a couple of scriptures. Apostle Paul writing to the Thessalonians, Let no man deceive you by any means, for that day shall not come except there be a falling away, and that the man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition. That day shall not come, don't be deceived. It's specifically referring to those end times, the seven-year tribulation or however you want to understand that. It's not going to come. Don't be deceived. So that's why I'm saying that this is not particularly the end times. Those two things haven't happened yet. So, uh, and it's, it's interesting. I want to add a little bit more to what Eric said. When something affects us, we start thinking a completely different way. I mean, what do you mean by like different it, way? in terms of uh, just our <laughs> perception of reality and eternity, because we think, oh, man, this virus is affecting me. Not even the fact that I'm sick, but I can't go to the store without a mask or I can't shake somebody's hand. People are suffering all over the world. And I would want to add way worse than us. People are being persecuted in, in China, in, in North Korea, in, in Pakistan. Christians are suffering. Uh, so for us to just have a perspective as well, step back for a little bit and see that there are things happening all around the world. 
<laughs> there are natural disasters. There are plagues. I, I've read about a story that there's locusts like, devouring uh, a place in Africa. Things are happening, but it shall not come to pass. Let's not be deceived. Stay in the word. Yeah, so I wanted to, uh, for those online joining us, uh, church, thank you for joining us. Uh, before we wrap up, I wanted to give uh, Brother John and Eric some just final last statements before we sign off, before we pray. Uh, and then uh, we'll, we'll be able to uh, end our church uh, online interview. Uh, Eric, what do you have, just uh, final thoughts? Uh, my final thought and what I would like to leave from this interview, I think this is an important thing that not, we're not the only ones talking about these questions. I know this. I know there's a lot of people in their groups or friends or family that are talking about these questions and trying to find answers to these things that are going on. But I would like to uh, leave off how I started to think soberly. Uh, don't be caught up in emotions. Don't let emotions rule your life and make uh, irrational decisions right now. Stay in the word. Uh, this is never changing. Our God is never changing. He has and controls everything. To have that thought r rule in your mind, not different types of uh, theories and, and fear. And as well as, I hope this thing comes to an end soon uh, because I miss all my friends. I miss all my brothers and sisters in Christ. I want to fellowship the way that I have uh, known my whole entire life. So uh, friends, just hang in there, uh, follow the rules, and hopefully we'll be back. I want to say that I love the church I miss the church. I can't wait to come back and see you guys and just shake your hand and give you a big hug. Uh, that's how I feel. At the same time, I just want to leave with one thought that let's not forget what's happening. Let's not come out of this quarantine and put everything at our backs and just continue living life like nothing's gonna change. If this is anything, and it's, a, it's an alarm to us as, a, as Christians, let's understand that life can change. Let's be ready. I don't want this to bring that to our minds, but if it has, then praise God for that. I just want us to be always ready, always prepared, and continuing to serve God in this time, however long it lasts. Yeah, so church, uh, those who are online, thank you for joining us. I wanted to end with my final thoughts. I've been praying and um, over this and over you and as well as the elders. We're on around the clock, especially uh, during the week. We meet twice a week for pray for your needs. Um, but I wanted to leave just some final thoughts. Uh, in Ephesians 5.15, uh, the Lord just uh, continues to, to, to kind of speak to this. And um, this verse that says in Ephesians 5.15 says, See then that you walk circumspectly, not as fools, but as wise. You see, this word circumspect means that you walk carefully with exactness, with precision. Um, in critical moments like the one we are living now, uh, we must have some kind of plan. We must have some kind of thought process. God could instruct us wisely if we go in our prayer closets to seek his wisdom. In Luke 14, 28 through 30, it talks about counting the cost before you build something. And it mentions in verse 28, for which of you intending to build a tower sitteth not down first and counteth the cost. And I believe every Christian should spend time, if you're watching this, spend time personally, spend time with your family, and ask the Lord to give you wisdom in the situation. We're, as Christians, um, we have a God with unlimited resources. We can access wisdom, especially for our time that it's unprecedented. We don't, as the brothers mentioned, we're not aware. We're not sure what's going to happen in an hour. We're not sure what's going to happen uh, the next day or how long this is going to last. But our God does. And so the, as the head of the household, sit down and get everybody else on board. And to be more specific in times like this, Christians should also, not only should we have a plan, hey, this is how our family is going to respond to this in, in, in prayerful matter, but also as Christians, we should to double down on our spiritual disciplines more than ever. The disciplines that you have, and I've noticed this, those Christians going into this pandemic, uh, they have doubled down on their spiritual disciplines. Talking even with our elders, uh, you guys are doing things more, praying more, reading your Bible more, uh, connecting more. And so I encourage the church that 
you need to double down on your spiritual disciplines. Maybe you haven't been praying as much, but spend more time in that prayer closet. Spend more time cultivating that relationship with your wife, with your, with your spouse, with your kids. Uh, because looking back, you need to look back at this and, and think, yeah, I grew in Christ during this critical moment. Because as we mentioned together, the mission of the Christian doesn't change. The world changes, governments change, pandemics go here and there, but the, the Christian's goal doesn't change. But church, I wanted to just pray on that thought uh, together, so let's bow our heads for a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, Lord, we're uh, thankful for this time. Thank you for uh, this interview that we had a chance to uh, talk about some of these questions and some of these subjects that uh, many uh, believers uh, have been thinking about. Lord, we're asking that you would just bless us, uh, continue to use us to glorify your name. I pray that you would bless our church, Lord, and uh, the church around this uh, world, this the U.S., Lord, that you would protect uh, the church. Also, uh, Lord, I pray for specifically for our church, for the needs of the church, Lord. There are many different needs that uh, we've been praying for through the week. You know this list. You know uh, those in need. Uh, may you bless uh, this world, Lord. May you continue to remove this virus from it, Lord, and also give your Christians wisdom. Help us to uh, soon gather soon together, and, and I pray Lord, that uh, it would be filled with joy. And I pray that through it all, through, the, through it all, as we're going through this pandemic, may the name of Jesus Christ be uh, glorified even more. We pray all this name, Jesus Christ. Amen.